Hello and welcome back to London Cycle Routes. Today I'll be showing you how to cycle from Canary Wharf in East London to Battersea Power Station in South West London. This ride takes around 45 to 50 minutes and you can do the whole thing on quiet streets and protected cycle lanes. By public transport the same journey takes around 40 minutes and requires a change of tube line so cycling is of a similar trip time. If you find this video useful or you just enjoy watching it then please don't forget to subscribe to the channel as I try to post new videos just like it every week. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to contribute as well then you can find a link in the description below the video. Alright let's get going. So we're starting at the foot of Canary Wharf DLR station with the DLR tracks over our heads just there. The first section of this video is about getting out of Canary Wharf and we do that by cycling alongside Fisherman's Walk which runs along the North Dock. This area is shared with pedestrians and can get a little bit busy at times so do be careful and courteous as you ride through there. We then take the North Dock footbridge to get over the dock. As far as I can tell you're allowed to cycle on this bridge, there are no signs saying that you can't and I've inspected the Canary Wharf website and can't find any mention as to whether or not you're allowed to cycle there. And also here on the dock side, it's pretty common to see people riding bikes here and I've also personally cycled past Canary Wharf security officers many times and no one's ever said anything so I think we can assume it's permitted. Obviously ride sensibly there so that Canary Wharf doesn't think twice about permitting it. Now if you look at the floor here you'll see an interesting detail. These two cables that we're riding over they're actually part of a traffic monitor of the kind that TfL and councils use to monitor traffic. They can actually tell the difference between cars, bikes and other vehicle traffic as well. The reason that's interesting to us is because those counters are usually installed in the early stages of planning cycle infrastructure or other road schemes like that. That does make me wonder whether TfL or Canary Wharf Group or maybe the council is thinking of improving that cycle route into Canary Wharf that we've just used. It is currently a bit messy, it passes through a car park, it uses a shared pavement and there's a lot you could do to tidy it up and just make it more obvious to people as well. There's only really one other reasonable way of cycling into Canary Wharf and that's via the riverfront on the other side. I don't intend to use that way in videos as it requires a dismount and to use either an elevator or to go up steps which I try to avoid in videos. But whatever's happening it is definitely welcome that someone is paying attention to that street. So hopefully we'll see some improvements proposed for there in the medium term. For now we're following the route of Cycleway 3 which is going to take us into Westminster. It's mostly on segregated lanes later on but this stretch here is on a quiet street called Narrow Street which is quiet because most of the traffic is routed on the main road which runs parallel and it doesn't really go anywhere usefully for cars. I've come this way many times and I've genuinely never seen this street more busy than it is now. You'll really only run into one or two cars for the whole route. So yeah, it's a nice ride and you don't need to worry about it if you're nervous cycling on the main carriageway. Make sure you follow the CS3 signs and the blue paint which will direct you around this corner and then there's another right turn as well up on a ramp which will take us into the park St James's Gardens but not before we cross the Limehouse Link Road on a bridge just here and that link road down there in that pit is where most of the traffic is going. Be careful as you cycle through the park as the cycle lane itself is very narrow. All cycle traffic is meant to go to the left of this white line with pedestrians on the right hand side and as you can see it's really not wide enough for two people to pass each other at speed in opposite directions. Just something to watch out for. This crossing here is a toucan crossing which means you can cycle over it as well as walk and it leads you onto the segregated lanes down Cable Street. 
These lanes are also a little bit on the narrow side, but I find that they're mostly all right. One thing to watch out for is this switch over here, which takes the track from the left side of the road to the right side of the road. In this direction, of course, you can see the traffic coming down the street as it's one way. But if you're doing this route in the opposite direction, then just make sure you check there are no cars speeding down the street as you make that right turn over to the other side as they might not be expecting you to pull out in front of them. While it would be nicer to have a wider cycle track, it is difficult to see how one could be fitted onto this street. Although there are sections here with parking which could be replaced, there are also genuinely narrow parts of the road, and I'm not sure that much wider tracks would necessarily fit all the way down the street. I have always appreciated this cycle lane though as I think it's a really good example of what you can fit down a narrow street like this which is not much wider than frankly the average residential street in London and yet they still have managed to put a reasonably decent two-way cycle track in there. So far this route has been fairly straightforward but it does get a little bit more complicated as we get past Westminster. So if you do need a little bit of help navigating the route, you can download the free map of the route, which is linked in the description below the video. It's on a website called Commute, but you can download from there a GPX file, which should work on whatever app or device that you want to use, whatever you like best. I do those maps for all my videos, but I try and mention them for people who aren't regular viewers because if I don't mention them, then people do tend to ask whether I can do one. I know that not everybody checks the description. The two sets of traffic lights on side roads like that one we just went through and the other one up ahead are probably the two main downsides of the Cable Street cycle track, I think. They don't give you a very long cycle phase and they do take a very long time to change, which is not something that would be immediately obvious in this video as I do obviously cut the wait times at the lights out when we're waiting for them. You can probably notice that when we're queuing at those lights, the people who are in front of me at the beginning of the light phase tend to disappear by the end of the light phase, probably because they have tend to have run the lights as a lot of people do which can be dangerous and actually probably undermines the whole point of putting in a traffic light there for safety in the first place. It would definitely be great to have those lights retimed so that it was a little bit less of a frustrating wait, seeing as how probably most of the people who travel down this street are actually on bikes. They're definitely, especially at rush hour, tend to outnumber car traffic and I think they probably do in this video as well. Especially because the cycle track is two-way and the street is one-way, so you're not just counting all the people who we've gone past, but there's actually just as many people cycling in the same direction as us who we never actually see in the video. The quality of the cycle track improves dramatically once you've crossed Marshall Street and it turns into a tarmac-coloured cycle lane instead of a blue one. For those that don't know, that's because this cycle track was actually built about 20 years later than the one we just went on. It didn't used to go all the way into central London, but it does now. One issue I'd be interested in hearing viewers' comments on is that of pedicabs or rickshaws like the one that I was and am struggling to overtake just here. In theory, I like the idea of a sort of green public transport option. In practice, I'm not sure that I'm such a fan. As we saw, they're very difficult to overtake in the cycle lanes, which they almost exclusively ride in, especially around Westminster. It's very common to see them parked up on pavements, uh, soliciting tourists for custom as well. And I'm sure we've also all probably seen the stories in the media about the rip-off fares that some of them seem to charge unsuspecting tourists too, which doesn't seem like a great idea to me. Certainly, I've never heard of a Londoner actually using one. Um, there were some new laws actually passed in March to give TfL the power to regulate them. And I'd be interested to hear in the comments below what people think that regulation should be. Should it be a very tight regulation that effectively bans them? Should they be allowed to use cycle lanes? Or should it be a bit more light touch just to ensure that the fares aren't a ripoff and they stay off the pavements? Do let me know what you think.
Now we're currently on Upper Thames Street, which is a not very pleasant dual carriageway, but it didn't always look like this. Until the 1960s, it was actually lined with brick warehouses and was quite a narrow street. Those warehouses were used for storing goods delivered by ship from the North Sea ports, which were unloaded and kept here. In the 1970s, they were torn down and replaced by this dual carriageway. Much of the land is now used for office buildings. I have to say I'm not a huge fan of this street. It's obviously perfectly fine to cycle on as we've got our own segregated lane. But as a place, I'm not sure it really belongs in the middle of the city. And I think we probably lost something. In terms of public space, place and heritage when the old version of it was torn down. Maybe one day when London has a little bit more public cash to spend, it could be a nice candidate for highway removal and we can have our riverfront back. Just a reminder that if you're enjoying this video, make sure you hit the subscribe button on YouTube and also hit the bell icon so that you're alerted when new videos are posted. I tend to post new videos every Sunday night. Every now and again, I might skip one, but I think I've been doing pretty well over the last few years. And if you want to support the channel for free, do just make sure that you hit the like button on YouTube as it does boost the video in YouTube's algorithm and helps other people find it. If you want to support the channel not for free, then you can also sign up on the Patreon. And thanks so much to all of those of you who do that. A link is in the description for anybody who would like to start doing so. Now, if you keep your eyes peeled on the left here coming up, you'll see a silver dragon statue sitting on a plinth. It is just here past this tree. Now, that is one of a pair of statues. There's another on the other side of the road, and they actually mark the boundary between the city of Westminster, which we're now in, and the city of London, which we just left when we crossed past the dragon statues. Those dragons are, of course, the same as the ones that are depicted on the city of London coat of arms. While that might seem like a sort of ancient marking or tradition, they were actually only put there in the 1960s. But despite that, the actual dragon sculptures themselves are much older and also have an interesting link to something that we saw earlier in the video. They were cast in 1849, but they only made it to their current spot in the 1960s. And that's because they actually sat at the entrance to the London Coal Exchange, which was demolished in the 1960s for road widening. Now you might be able to guess which road we're talking about. Yes, the Coal Exchange was one of the buildings demolished to turn Thames Street into a dual carriageway, but the dragons were rescued and they were put here to mark the boundary to the city. Now, talking of widening, if you look on our left, you can't really see through the fence, but just imagine there's actually some widening going on there. The embankment is actually being extended further into the Thames and there should hopefully be a new public space there, which will open either later this year or next year, hopefully. The reason that's being created is because they're building the new Thames Tideway Tunnel next to the embankment, otherwise known as the Super Sewer, which should hopefully relieve some of the city's, uh, let's say, digestive problems and result in cleaner water in the Thames. Now, if you look on our left here after this tree, you'll see one of those pedicabs sitting on the pavement. Actually, you'll see quite a few of them. And yeah, that's what I mean about them taking up pavement space in busy areas. And yeah, I don't think they should be allowed to do that for sure. The pavements there are definitely crowded enough as it is to the point of being dangerous. And I'm really not sure what they're adding, frankly. Now, you could turn left here to get towards Battersea, but I'm actually going to go straight on towards Great George Street. I imagine a lot of you viewers who take this journey will probably choose to go left and, you know, more power to you. But on these videos, I try and avoid the Lambeth Ridge roundabout as it is a bit of a black spot and Abingdon Street also doesn't have any protection on it and is a little bit on the busy side at rush hour. 
Both of those things should change soon. Westminster Council is planning segregated lanes on Abingdon Street and has consulted on them. And the TfL is in the process of rebuilding the Lambeth Bridge roundabout, which will probably take a while, but will be really nice when it's done, I imagine. For now, though, it's a good opportunity to go this way. Now, this little junction here isn't fantastic, frankly. As you can see, it's a bit chaotic with tourist coaches and big 4x4s doing U-turns in the middle of the road. A safe cycle crossing would definitely be nice there. But once you get onto Great Smith Street, it's actually quite a pleasant place to ride a bike. This section that we're on now is basically rush hour, and this is pretty much as busy as it gets. This street, as well as Marsham Street, which we're just coming on to, and John Islip Street later, are a nice alternative way of getting from Westminster down to the Vauxhall Bridge Junction, and specifically Vauxhall Bridge Road, which we'll be getting to in a sec. As you can see, there's very little traffic here, and this is at the evening rush hour. In the morning rush hour, it's also probably arguably even quieter, and on the weekends, it's completely dead with basically no cars. I have to go from Vauxhall Bridge to Westminster for work, and I actually find myself coming this way rather than down Cycleway 8 on the main road down Millbank, just because it's a nicer way to ride. John Islip Street, which we're on now, is even nicer, and when those trees have full leaves on them, look absolutely lovely, especially on a summer's evening. Of course, if you don't mind the roundabout and Abingdon Street, then you could just go down the riverfront, which I think is the way that most people go, but if you've got a little bit more time and you just want a nicer ride, I reckon give this one a go. We then turn on to Vauxhall Bridge Road's protected cycle lane, which is very well used and, in my opinion, should be extended all the way to Victoria. But you see that there's a no right turn for bike sign here, and we want to go right, so this is what we do. We go through the junction, and then we turn left down this little cycle track, and we go around and find ourselves in the advanced stop line. And from here, we can go straight on, which is the equivalent of a right turn. Sounds complicated, but it's actually really simple, and unlike a lot of left go left to go right situations, this one is actually really safe and in segregated lanes the whole time. If you're doing this route in the opposite direction, then you'll be on the other side of the road. You can see that there's a wand protected cycle lane on both sides of the road, and you can simply turn left from there to go down Vauxhall Bridge Road. So this route does work in both directions. I don't really use Cycleway 8 very often in videos and the reason for that is that it doesn't really connect to much at the western end because it tends to run into the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea which is notoriously bad at infrastructure. In fact, part of the reason that I've done this video in the first place was because I wanted to use Cycleway 8 in a video. The reason for that is that I really like it. It has pretty much continuous segregated lanes which are nice and wide and have a good surface running all the way directly down the riverfront. What more could you want? Well, I'm sure you could improve it in a number of ways, but the point remains that it is just a really pleasant ride. When Lambeth Bridge roundabout has been sorted out, and Abingdon Street has its protected lanes, you will be able to cycle all the way from Chelsea Bridge through to Cycleway 3 and therefore through to Canary Wharf just on the main roads on segregated lanes, which will be really nice. One day as well, hopefully you might be able to go further west on it because Transport for London wants to take this route further down Chelsea Embankment. They think they can fit it down there. But unfortunately, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, as you might expect, is being rather uncooperative. So the route ends at Chelsea Bridge, which we're coming up to just now. Now, we want to turn left here. There is a no left turn, but it says accept cycles. So we're all good, and we can use the lightly segregated lane on the bridge. Unfortunately, in the opposite direction, you don't have a lane of your own. You have to use the bus lane, which is not as good as having a cycle lane, but does work. You have to go right in the opposite direction at that junction we just did and in order to do that 
you would first turn left and then use the next phase of the light to turn right. I have done some videos illustrating it, but it's also the same principle as pretty much what we just did there. We turned left, we waited for the green signal to cross the road, and then we went right. Now I'm gonna show you how to get into Battersea Power Station from here. We went to Battersea Park and then we can go down the Riverside Walk and we can cycle on this little walkway which will lead us straight through. If you come here after dark and Battersea Park is closed, then you will have to go down the steps and dismount, which is not ideal at all. And I'm sorry, I do try to avoid dismounts in my videos as I know that not everybody can dismount, but yeah, that's unfortunately the way to get in. As you can see, there is a shared space sign on these lamp posts, and you are allowed to cycle up here through the gardens as indicated by the cycle route sign which is on that lamppost there as well and so we've made it all the way to Battersea Power Station from Canary Wharf if you're still with me after that long ride thanks for sticking with it I hope you enjoyed it especially that fact about the dragons which I thought was pretty cool but well done for sitting through a 21 minute video that is very impressive do let me know what you think in the comments hit that like button so other people can find the video and make sure you're subscribed thanks again to everybody on the patreon and if anybody new is feeling generous then you can find a link in the description below the video i'll see you all again next time goodbye